Um, the title of this webinar is Who Tells Your Story? Exploring Women and Identity. Um, we're really excited to have you here with us today, virtually. Um, I'd just like to introduce our three panelists here today. Um, and before I do that, I just want to clarify, you may see the name Peg Ketch um, in the chat box or as part of the webinar, and none of us are Peg Ketch. Uh, she's one of our colleagues in education at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and our Zoom account is registered in her name. So that's why you'll see things like Peg writing or Peg talking, but Peg is not actually here. <laughs> Um, so I'll introduce myself. My name is Phoebe Hilleman. I'm the Teacher Institute's Educator at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. My name is Brianna Zavadil-White. I'm the Head of Education for the National Portrait Gallery. Hi, I'm Ann Showalter, and I'm the Digital Interpretation Specialist at SAM. Um, and I think to get to know a little bit more about you all, we're going to start with a poll question, Phoebe? Yes. So we wanted to just get a quick sense of who participated in the first webinar that we had in October. So I'm uh, putting up a poll here that you can uh, participate in. So just let us know if you were able to join us in October or not. Great. So it looks like about two thirds yeah. so far have participated in the first uh, webinar and about Excellent. one third are new to us. So welcome. All right, fantastic. Yeah. That's really good for us to know. For those of you who are joining us a second time, welcome back. We missed you. For those of you who are here the first time, welcome. Um, the previous webinar is archived and available for you to watch later if um, if you'd like to, to catch up on what we did last month. So. Um, before we really dive in and look at our featured artworks today, we just wanted to tell you a, very quickly um, a little bit about who we are at, at SAM and MPG. So both the American Art Museum and the National Portrait Gallery are part of the larger Smithsonian Institution, which is made up of 19 different museums and galleries, as well as the National Zoo. And so um, while most of the Smithsonian Museums line the National Mall, we're located in this sort of flashing section uh, up north of the mall, a few blocks up from the mall, uh, and then the facade of our building is, is sort of flashing there at the bottom of the screen. And I say our building because the American Art Museum and the National Portrait Gallery share a building. So yes, we, we, do. we have a special relationship <laughs> within the, the larger Smithsonian family, although we have separate staff, separate collections, and separate missions. So the American Art Museum is home to one of the largest and most inclusive collections of American art in the world. We have over 44,000 works in our collection that span more than 300 years of American history. And our mission is to celebrate the creativity of artists whose work reflects the American experience and global connection. Um, thank you. That was mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, and it is, it's always such a joy to work with the American Art Museum because although we are two separate museums, um, I think our collections speak to each other really well. Um, so the National Portrait Gal Gallery has a very clear mission. Um, our mission is to tell the story of this country through the people who have shaped it. Um, we consider ourselves to be um, a museum that looks at portraiture through three lenses. The visual arts lens, of course, the biography lens, and the history lens. Um, so for those of you that attended last month, this is not new information, but we do feel it's really important to acknowledge the Smithsonian American Women's History Initiative. Um, both the Portrait Gallery and the American Art Museum are proud to participate in this initiative, which is called Because of Her Story. Um, it is a digital first mission um, and focus. Um, and really what um, Because of Her Story is doing is using technology to amplify a diversity of women's voices, um, which is why this particular webinar falls so nicely um, within the initiative. So what the Portrait Gallery and the American Art Museum did was we submitted um, a proposal to create a series of teaching posters that you see on the screen right now. Um, each of the three webinars highlights um, two images, one from the Portrait Gallery, one from the American Art Museum, and then in each of the webinars we also highlight additional images um, in each of our collections. This is the second of three webinars and the third will be next month. 
Um, obviously, you all are registered for this webinar. You are here with us. You will, of course, receive a full set of the posters mm -hmm. um, in the coming weeks. And many of you, maybe two thirds of you have already received your posters because you joined us last time. If you've already received your poster set in the mail, could you just put a, a yes in the chat box? Hopefully, we, we sent many, many out, so hopefully they've been received. <laughs> Well, we'll talk, we'll talk more about posters at the end, especially if you haven't received them yet. Um, but before we, we get to the, the two pieces um, in the poster set that are the center of our time together, as well as those supplemental images, we just wanted to quickly go over the goals for our series. Um, and this is, these are our overarching goals that apply to each um, each webinar that we're going to be doing and these goals will be familiar to those of you who have already joined us. Uh, really what we're working towards in, in this webinar and all the others is, is building to how can you take away what we're introducing you to and incorporate it into your classroom. And so we look forward to having time at the end of today's webinar to hear from you all um, on that front. So for today's webinar in particular, um, our essential question is, what is the importance of being able to express yourself and voice your story? So we're exploring women and identity and agency. Um, and so we're gonna move on to our very first artwork. And in order to sort of get to know this artwork, which if you have received your poster set you've, you've seen before, we're gonna engage in an artful thinking routine developed by Project Zero researchers at Harvard's Graduate School of Education. We gave a brief introduction to Project Zero in last month's webinar. Um, so if you weren't able to join us then and you aren't familiar with Project Zero, I encourage you to watch the archived October webinar or to visit Project Zero's website, which you see the URL here um, at the bottom of this slide. So the routine that we're gonna be doing right now is called Looking 10 Times 2. And so in just a moment, we'll show you our first artwork. I'm gonna ask you to look closely. Phoebe will take the magnifying glass on the computer to zoom in so that you can see more details. And with the, the pen and the paper that you have nearby, please list 10 words or phrases that come to mind as you look at that image. And so for the sake of time, we won't ask you to share um, these in the chat box for right now. We'll give you about a minute, about 60 seconds to jot down um, these 10 words or phrases. Okay, so here's our artwork. Take a few seconds to look at it, um, sort of zoomed out, and then Phoebe will zoom into some details and we'll give you about a minute to, to jot down to yourself those 10 words or phrases. So. As you're doing that, Brianna, yes. do you have any words or phrases that come to mind when you look at this artwork? Um, why, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that uh, strikes me about this piece is um, the use of color mm -hmm. um, and the use of materials. Mm -hmm. um, I also can't help but think of um, this idea of uh, powerful mm -hmm. um, and yet relaxed. Yeah. Um, patterns definitely mm -hmm. are popping out. Um, and how can I not mention the large tiger? <laughs> Is that a tiger? It, 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 On yes. the left hand side? Yes. Um, and the shoes. Yeah. yeah. The, um, the heels, again, this idea of texture. Right. And very sparkly. So, so I love that you're focusing both on sort of some objects or some accessories in the artwork, but then um, you're also thinking about how you would describe the figure. And so saying both powerful and relaxed, that's a really uh, intriguing juxtaposition. I think there's a lot to unpack there. Um, okay, so that was your looking times 10 times one. Um, now what we invite you to do is to repeat this activity. So you're gonna look again and uh, come up with 10 additional words or phrases. And so for the, the sake of time, we'll give you just about 30 seconds to jot down these new words. Um, so go ahead and, and take that time to see what else you can, you can observe as you, as you look. So Brianna, anything else on a second look? Yes, 
I was thinking about the um, the contrasting colors that are here. Mm. Um, I mean, at first I was thinking um, about the red, white, and blue mm. of her outfit um, and the cool colors that you see sort of throughout, but then there are these other warmer tones. Um, and I think it allows your eye to wander. I realize that these are neither words nor phrases. <laughs> these are more observations. Um, but definitely with the with the contrasting colors um and with those with those contrasting colors and the patterns mm -hmm. um i think definitely allows our eye to move yeah, around yeah well what i love about the the thinking routines is you can you can be sort of flexible in the way that you're using them That's true. really the goal of this routine is to get you to look and then get you to look again so that sometimes students say well i looked i saw it right what else is there to see right. and it's like well look again look harder look closer there's going to be more that's going to unfold whenever you do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, great. So if you could now in the chat box, please share one new thing that you wrote down, one new word or phrase, one new observation you made um, on that second round of looking. And go ahead and put that in the chat box. And Phoebe will um, sort of see what's coming in and recap for us. Oh, there we go. I think our chat box is not working right for us for a second there. Yeah, so I think we had a, an issue with our chat box. We're, we're actually now seeing that so many of you got your posters, which warms our hearts because that's great. Okay. We were not seeing those. Okay, so thank you for that. Now I'm loving Phoebe, if you can kind of recap right. some of the things that we're seeing on yeah. our second look through. Okay, we're seeing um, some stuff about the relationship between the patterns and the background. She's seeing the word conflict, conflicting background versus subject because of pattern. Um, the comparison between the colors of the furniture and the brightly colored clothes. Mm -hmm. Words like fierce, confidence, or cool confidence, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, beauty, shadows, flattened, stylish, graphic, stitching. Interesting, but strong, vibrant self-confidence. Oh, question about whether it's a painting or a mirror. Mm -hmm. uh, in that frame uh, on the left side. Um, perfect. So, tons of really great observations okay. here. Okay, wonderful. So, um, we'll share a little bit of information about this artwork. Note that we didn't tell you anything about it before we asked you to look. Um, so that's something that we encourage you to do with your students uh, to not sort of box in their initial um, engagement with the piece and then to share uh, to layer in information as the conversation progresses. So if you could uh, move to the next slide for us, Phoebe, we're going to see that this is a piece. Um, it's a 2010 work by McLean Thomas. She is a leading contemporary artist and she's known for her large scale paintings of black women posed against boldly patterned backgrounds and adorned with rhinestones. Uh, so more on that in a moment. But the, the sort of most prominent themes in Thomas's work are these notions of black female beauty, sexuality, power, and identity. And so the sitter in this painting, Manja, is a friend of the artist and as is typical of the way that the artist works, uh, Manja was invited to Thomas's studio in Brooklyn for a photo shoot. And so the two women work together, they, they collaborate and sort of build up this tableau. Um, and they then choose what Manja will be wearing and what sort of props might be around her. And then Micheline Thomas takes photographs from this session and uses them as the source for her large scale paintings. Um, and Mickling Thomas has spoken about how important it is for her to create works that allow young people to see themselves positively represented in environments like museums, where Black women, both as subjects of art and as creators of art, have historically been marginalized, stereotyped, or altogether absent. So if we just sort of take a quick glance here at Portrait of Manja on the left, where we have a, a Black woman celebrated as the artwork's central figure, um, and then we compare that with the two works on the right, we can see how McLean Thomas is both participating in, but then also transforming the art historical canon. Um, one kind of additional nugget uh, of context for this piece, 
Uh, McLean Thomas made Portrait of Manja for the official residence of Ambassador Susan Rice as part of a program called Arts and Embassies that uses art to promote cultural diplomacy in U.S. embassies and consulates. So Susan Rice was the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations from 2009 until 2013, and she was the first African-American woman to hold this position. So next we're gonna watch um, an excerpt. It's about a minute long uh, from an artist interview that we did at SAM with McLean Thomas in front of Portrait of Manja in the galleries, which will start to really give you a sense of scale. Um, and so you're gonna hear McLean Thomas discuss some of the decisions that she made in, in creating this work. For um, Ambassador Susan Rice, I thought that it would be really important to convey a female figure from, from my perspective and from my practice, someone who would view the sense of what Susan Rice represented, you know, at the particular time and the political stance and power, but also um, patriotic, you know? And so that's why looking through all of my clothes that I had, um, for Manja, I selected, you know, these particular colors, really subtle signifiers that would represent our flag, but also represent the United States and represent Susan Rice's position and um, also represent her being this African American woman in this highly profiled position and a sense of power. Okay, so you can um, watch that full interview as well as two additional related videos in this webinar's Learning Lab collection. So for those of you who are new, um, there is a fantastic platform that the Smithsonian has called a, Lo a Learning Lab. And so we will uh, share a link. All you'll need is that link and then you'll have access to um, all of the artwork and the, and the resources and the supplemental material that we've shared with you uh, throughout today's webinar. And so Phoebe will share that with you at the end. Um, are we still having chat box issues, Evie? Yeah, I'm having trouble pulling up the chat, so it's hard to tell if there's something right there. Oh, there we go. All right. Um, so in that Learning Lab collection, you could watch the, the, the full version of the video that we uh, just played an excerpt from. It's about three minutes long. And in that video, Thomas is talking about Portrait of Manja specifically. There's also a, another video there where she's talking about um, her artistic influences and the materials that she uses, in, including her sort of a signature uh, material of the rhinestones. Uh, and then there's also a video in the Learning Lab collection that you see there on the right side of your screen. There is a um, interpretive video series we have here at SAM called Reframe, and one of the episodes focuses on this work in particular. So if you, if you give me a, a mouse click, um, you can see this gives you again a great sense of scale that's like a five eight woman standing in front of <laughs> in front of this gigantic work so uh, much more about portrait of manja in the learning lab collection but before we now move to a portrait from mbg's collection is there anything else that came in in the, in the chat box for you or is there anything else about portrait of manja that struck you as you were hearing from the artists or we were sort of looking closely not once but twice um thoughts about how you might uh make connections to your curriculum. We'll pause for just a minute to see if there's anything coming in before we close the loop on um, Portrait of Manja. <laughs> um, yeah, looks like I can't see anything new coming in in the chat box um, so far, but this is a piece that I've used again and again with mm -hmm. students and it always really draws people in um, especially when you get a sense of the sparkle um, mm -hmm. in person mm -hmm. and the video does a great job of um, bringing that across um, and just that idea of a powerful black woman being represented on such a large scale in a museum is is so powerful especially when we look at our historical examples to mm -hmm. compare it to right. um, yeah okay. great we've got a comment from Cheryl in the chat box about um, the idea of symbols and connections with what she's wearing. Mm. Um, great. So yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of symbolism in the color choices of, the, of her mm. clothing with mm. the red, white, and blue. Oh, awesome. <laughs> uh, for ELL is a great way to practice descriptive words. Um, 
a comparison to the painting Le Grand Odalisque, um, similar in scale. So that would be an awesome comparison. And then Evelyn says she's used Manjo with Beyonce lyrics and videos, um, which is an excellent connection as well. Mm -hmm. Great, great. <laughs> Thank you all for that. So I will now turn things over to Brianna. Excellent. Thank you, Anne. Um, I wanted to take a little bit of time um, to, uh, to talk about this portrait, but the first thing that I would actually like you to do is um, go back to this idea that, um, that Anne had said, where we don't necessarily always start with context or contextual information about a work because we don't want to um, box people into very specific ideas or notions about um, an artwork. So if you can grab your pen or pencil and paper um, and begin to think about um, a character sketch that you might have about this individual and write down either three words or phrases that you might use to describe this person. Um, and while you're jotting down your ideas, Anne is going to share um, with all of us what she's thinking about this individual based on what she sees. Okay. Um, so the first word that comes to mind when I look at this portrait is warm. She just feels warm to me, and I don't know if it's a combination of the artist's use of color or light, but then also combined with like her facial expression, she just seems like a, like a warm person, like someone you'd want to be around. Right, right. There is that, that engagement, yeah. right? Um, it feels as if she's engaged with the audience, um, but also has that smile. Yeah. So it's like you want to get yeah. to know her, and she genuinely wants to get to know you. Yeah. yeah. Excellent, excellent. Um, so, Phoebe, can you click on the next? Yeah. Thank you. Um, this is Henrietta Lacks. Um, I don't know how many of you know who she is, um, and I will be honest that I didn't know who she was until um, really just before this portrait came into the Portrait Gallery's collection. Um, I want to share a little bit of information um, about her, um, but I actually want to start with the artist who created this work. Um, this piece is by Kadir Nelson, um, and it dates from 2017. Um, and Kadir Nelson um, is an award-winning artist. He is an author. He's an illustrator of over 30 children's books that highlight African-American history. And I was really struck by this quote um, that he says about um, why he creates the work that he does. Um, and he says, my work is all about healing and giving people a sense of hope and nobility. And I wanna show the strength and integrity of the human spirit. And he goes on to talk about um, giving this portrait to um, the Portrait Gallery and the African American History Museum. Um, and he says, I elected to paint a prideful and glowing portrait of Henrietta Lacks, who is often referred to as the mother of modern medicine, visually juxt juxtaposing art and science. And that really struck me when I read that quote, one, because it's not very often that we at the Portrait Gallery get to think about art and science together, um, but also this idea of prideful and glowing, which I think goes back to what Anne just said about um, the warmth um, that you feel when you look at this piece. So Henrietta Lacks was born in 1920 um, and she died in 1951, but she was the mother of five children. She grew up on a tobacco farm in Southern Virginia and she had a profound impact on medicine, but it was an impact that she never knew in her lifetime. She was diagnosed with cervical cancer at the age of 31 and that was January of 1951. And her story is part of a larger story of medical testing on African Americans without their consent. So before Lax succumbed to the disease in October of 1951, doctors at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, they removed extra tissue samples from her body during a biopsy. They then discovered that her cells lived long lives and reproduced basically indefinitely in a lab. And so this was significant because before Henrietta Lacks, when cells were harvested, they would die off within a couple of days. And so um, when doctors 
harvested these cells. These were the first cells that lived long lives. So these immortal cells um, have been named HeLa cells for Henrietta Lacks. Um, and what is amazing about HeLa cells is that they have contributed to over 10,000 medical patents. I was reading that more than 60,000 medical articles have been written about HeLa cells. Um, but what is really significant about them is that in the early 1950s, Jonas Salk used them to develop the polio vaccine sparking widespread, in, widespread interest among medical researchers. And since then, these cells have led to scientific insights on genetics and on conditions such as AIDS, cancer, and Parkinson's disease. But the Lacks family never knew about the HeLa cells until 1973, more than 20 years um, after um, Henrietta Lacks's death. So, the story is sort of shifts and evolves um, and it becomes more contemporary and we'll get into that in a little bit. But I do just want you to start to begin to think about this idea of how um, the fact that Henrietta Lacks never knew that these cells were taken from her and her family didn't know until 1973 and how we can begin to think about her story and these cells and how they've raised questions about ethics um, of using genetic materials without the patient's permission and the legal protection of personal medical information. So that was a lot of very heavy um, information in a short period of time, but I felt like um, the context was important um, to get into some of the questions that I'm going to pose to Anne, but also I want you all to be thinking about as well. So Anne. Yes, Brianna. <laughs> um, so Lax's dress and fingernails um, are a very vibrant red. What emotions do we associate um, with the color red? Um, well, kind of like, t I think of things like blood right. um, and sort of like a life force. Um, so it, it's a very vibrant color. Um, but then I also think of like sirens, ambulance, danger. Um, so I, it's mixed. It's a mixed bag. Right, right. I mean, initially, right, we always talked about, you know, red, orange, and yellow mm -hmm. from, the, from the time that we were young kids as being these very warm colors, yeah. which is interesting because it goes back to what you were saying previously. Yeah. Um, but we do often associate colors, right, with our own personal experiences. Um, so when you look at the rest of this piece, we definitely see that Kadir Nelson has um, also highlighted blue um, within this portrait. And then there's tones of um, white um, moving into a little bit of yellow. So there's not, there's not a significant number of colors. Um, I think that he tries to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. And I wonder why he's chosen to do that. What, do you, what effect do you think it has that, I mean, really we're looking at red, yellow, blue, and white. And we have a comment in the chat box yeah. here that the colors seem patriotic and a question about whether this means that Kadir Nelson wanted to show her as being part of the American framework. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's an interesting link between this painting yeah. and the last one we looked at. Right, absolutely, absolutely. Because right in the last piece, there was a variety mm -hmm. um, of colors and we talked about the conflicting and the contrasting colors um, and this is very simple. And so we definitely see the red, white, and blue. Mm -hmm. I do often, when I see this piece, think about posters um, because when, when we look at posters, um, most, many posters um, have very simple colors, the red, the yellow, and the blue, right, which are our primary colors, mm -hmm. um, which draw our eye in. Um, so that could be run one of the reasons why he's doing that for this piece. So um, let's take a closer look at the background, Phoebe, if we could. Um, what or how might these patterns be significant? I mean, I always say that everything happens in portraiture for a reason, mm -hmm. right? It's all there to tell this individual's story. What do you think of when you see them? Um, 
So, and I'm actually seeing in the chat box already people are talking about cells and Petri dishes. Oh. So when you know a little bit about her story, then you, it, it sort of takes on that, that symbolism. Right. And this is, I mean, this is the power of context, right? This is why we love it so much mm -hmm. and why it's really important to the teaching practice. Um, when you're looking at images, when we have a little bit of that backstory, it is important to share it because I think that it extends um, our understanding of the piece for sure. So Kadir Nelson talks about um, that pattern in the background um, as being representative of the flower of life. Um, which is actually an ancient symbol of immortality and exponential growth, mm -hmm. which leads nicely into the comment mm -hmm. that we received right about the petri dishes and the um, and the growth of cells. Mm -hmm. um, I want to shift also to her clothing mm -hmm. because it it didn't. Um, I didn't notice this in the beginning, but um, if you notice, um, there is something missing from her clothing. Any ideas of what might be missing? Yeah. Ah, yeah, we've got some comments in the chat box. It's like missing buttons, yeah. two, two buttons missing. Is that right, right Brianna? It is right. And so um, what Nelson was trying to do here was he was referencing the fact that her cells were taken without her knowledge. Um, I think the other interesting piece too is the pearls that she is wearing around her neck. Um, a doctor had said that when um, when uh, when when tumors were removed, um, that it looked like the tumors were pearls, mm -hmm. um, and so Nelson is very clearly referencing that in this piece. As you can see, I mean, he definitely has infused this portrait with all sorts of um, with all sorts of symbols Oops. about Henrietta Lacks. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. So. As we've said, her cells continue to grow and live on in scientific research. Um, and this portrait um, is really interesting because it is almost seven feet high um, and about six feet wide. Why do we think that the scale of this portrait might be significant? Yes. Yeah, this idea that she's a larger than life figure and seeing that in the chat box, uh, monument, monumental scale giving her importance. We saw that with the McLean Thomas painting as well. Um, so the, the question was, what does this significance, what is the significance of the large scale? Um, so we had one person who needed us to repeat the question. Um, claim space and history. I love the way you phrased that. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so this, this uh, recurring theme of scale in artwork conveying significance. Right. And when you are in the gallery, it is really wonderful because you are looking up um, always at her, no matter what your vantage point is. Um, and so it really does have the effect of, of Lax being this larger than life figure. There were some questions about this, like, brooch whatever is above the buttons on the dress right so um, if you notice it is also in the shape of a flower um, and I think that we've certainly seen throughout this piece that this whole idea of the flower of life is um, here over and over and over again especially with the background and with the patterning on her dress but in addition to that at the center of the flower are more pearls mm -hmm. um, and so it's the same reference um, of having the pearl necklace so I want to move us right along um, and just think about this idea. Um, and I think that this really goes nicely to, um, um, I think it goes nicely to what Anne was saying previously about starting with observation and then moving on to a little bit of context. Um, and so 
we use this particular thinking routine, which is I used to think and now I think to explore how and why our thinking has changed. Um, and while we're not going to do it right now, um, really the idea is, is you start with what your initial ideas were about this individual, that character sketch that you started with. Um, and then you move into, now that I have a little bit of context, now that I have a little bit of more information, how have your ideas about lax, lax shifted and changed based on that context? Um, so I would definitely encourage you with a piece like this to use, I used to think and now I think. Mm -hmm. I also wanna pull up very quickly um, this particular photograph because Obviously, Kadir Nelson never had any interaction with Henrietta Lacks, and there um, are just two surviving photographs of Henrietta Lacks that are owned by her family, and this is one of them, and you can see very clearly that Nelson was using this piece um, when he created um, the painting that's in the Portrait Galleries mm -hmm. collection. Um, and if you move on to the next slide, Phoebe, I just wanted to highlight very quickly before we move on um, this wonderful um, technique text to image connection that you can make with this with this image. Um, so one of the reasons why so many people know about Henrietta Lacks' story now is Rebecca Skloot wrote um, a book about her in 2010, which was then turned into an HBO movie in 2017, um, which was produced and starred Oprah Winfrey. Um, and it was HBO that commissioned the portrait of Henrietta Lacks that you see here. Um, but it is really a wonderful book. And I think um, making that connection between her words and that story with the image would prove fruitful in the classroom. Um, I did see one comment I wanted to respond to before we uh, shift to our next artwork. There was a question about where people can see these uh, works um, in person. So mm -hmm. Portrait of Manja is on view um, at, on the third floor of the Smithsonian Amer American Art Museum in our uh, contemporary art gallery. I believe Henrietta Lacks is so Henrietta Lacks is off view currently, but that portrait will come back on view um, in April. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Great. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so next, so we just looked at Portrait of Manja and Henrietta Lacks, and both of those are part of the poster set. Um, in our, in the next 10 minutes or so, we'd like to highlight one more additional, uh, work from Sam and then, uh, sort of pair from MPG that also fall under this, this larger theme. And the, all of this is included, as I said, in the Learning Lab collection that we'll share with you at the end of our time together. There are also additional works from the two museums collections that we aren't referencing um, in the webinar itself, but that and when we were sort of, you know, coming up with our list of finalists, uh, we wanted to just include uh, for you all as sort of something that, that fits under this larger umbrella as you think about um, how we, how your collection might be used, how our collection might be used in your classroom. So um, the final Sam piece that we're going to look at is here. Uh, and we're going to look at an example of an artist who, who has a great deal of agency in how her story and her family story is being told sort of in, in contrast to, um, to Henrietta Lacks and the sort of the, the lack of, of control or knowledge that um, went into her story. So this is a piece by contemporary uh, LA-based photographer, Christina Fernandez, and it's entitled Maria's Great Expedition. So the artist has photographed herself here um, in these six artworks, sort of in the guise of her great-grandmother, whose name was Maria Gonzalez. And her great-grandmother was the first member of her family to migrate to the United States from Mexico. And so it was interesting when um, I just heard Brianna say that there are only two uh, existing photographs of Henrietta mm -hmm. Lacks. Is that true? Yeah. There were also only two photographs of um, the artist's great grandmother. And so when she wanted to sort of visually tell her family's story, she realized that there weren't enough photographs to do that. Mm -hmm. So she was going to have to sort of step in uh, and take on the role of her great grandmother. And so, you know, in both cases, it sort of brings up these questions of who gets photographed, whose lives are documented, by whom and why, or in some cases, why not? Um, and so uh, while this is very a very personal story for the artist, 
she's also sort of connecting it to this larger story of um, immigration in, in the southwestern United States. And then she's also connecting it to this idea of just the sort of the power of women more broadly. So Phoebe, if you can pull up the artist's quote, uh, Christina Fernandez has said that she, she's realized something about the universality of, of this story, the idea that um, women's strength is something that can never be overdone or overstated, but that those are often the stories that aren't told. And so um, if we go to the next slide, Phoebe, this is actually what the work looks like. If you click one more time, you can see how the work looks when it's installed in the gallery. So while that image we just saw, which is sort of the way that sort of the official image on uh, Sam's website, it, the, the works are stitched together. It's actually an installation that appears as uh, sort of separately. We have the map that traces her grandmother's journey from Mexico to Colorado and then um, down to Arizona and eventually to California but then we have those six uh, distinct photographs. Um, what you're seeing here is the way that the work was on view um, in 2013 in an exhibition that Sam did called Our America, the Latino Presence in American Art. And there's more information about that exhibition um, in the Learning Lab collection. But if Phoebe, uh, yeah, take this forward once, um, you can see that in addition to the images, uh, so what you see in the far left here, that's the label that the curator wrote, like the very far left of this image. But you see the text that is below each of the six photographs. Um, that is actually a part of the artwork. So th that's a bilingual narrative. So you'll see sort of two sides, one's in English and one's in Spanish. So it's a bilingual narrative written by the artist to sort of accompany each of the photographs. Each one sort of tells a, a pivotal uh, moment in her great grandmother's life. And it spans 40 years. It starts in 1910, and then the last photograph, photograph is uh, depicting an event that happened um, in 1950. Uh, so we're going to hear a little bit more about this piece from um, Carmen Ramos, who is the deputy chief curator at the American Art Museum and um, our curator of Latino art. the artist very carefully and deliberately wants to convey to us that this is an intervention in the past. Throughout each of the photographs, she gives us hints that these are contemporary photographs. Uh, so for example, in, in this photograph that depicts her life in Colorado, she presents herself wearing a fanny pack, which is something that didn't exist in the 1920s. In this photograph, depicting her time in, uh, in Arizona selling uh, produce during the Depression, we see the back of a car whose vintage is more like the 1970s um, or 80s. Um, and in the final uh, photograph, she holds a, a flyer, a 99 cent flyer, which relates to the 99 cent stores that are very much part of our contemporary life. This project, I think, encourages viewers to rethink American history and to consider how Chicanos, Mexican Americans, Latinos have participated in uh, the history of the United States. So for the sake of time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up um, and turn things back over to Brianna, but I just wanted to close with um, a suggested thinking routine to pair with this artwork and that's question starts. I love this, it's one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, it really encourages students to to develop varied questions about a topic and to think deeply. And you could do this at the very beginning uh, of uh, a topic or working with um, an artwork or an object, or you could do it towards, towards the middle as sort of a way to extend the conversation. And I'll just put a plug in for my very favorite question on here, which is <laughs> how would it be different if? I think that often just when I'm in front of an artwork and mm -hmm. it's a sort of a really good way to think about uh, what sort of uh, what role each and every element of that artwork is playing? Yep. So I agree. Okay. I agree. All right.
Um, so Anne was so right. It was so hard to choose um, the other image that we would talk about for this um, particular webinar. Um, but I very clearly was thinking about um, this idea of who's telling your story um, and looking back to the past and specifically thinking about Pocahontas. Um, so when you hear the name Pocahontas, what image comes to mind? And this is something that you can just think about, um, but visualize for yourselves um, when you hear this name, where's Pocahontas, where is Pocahontas going to be? What is she going to be wearing? You know, how is she going to be portrayed? Um, so just think on that um, while Phoebe brings up um, a very short video um, that I'd like you to take a peek at. What I'd like to do is really look at similarities and differences in these two images. I think a huge difference is that one is an engraving and one is a painting. A similarity is that it is the same person. Her hat, it is the same. How about her hand? Definitely very similar. Also, we might say a little awkward. This jacket that she's wearing in the painting, it's a very rich velvet cloth. And in the engraving, it seems a little more like armor, uh, certainly a pattern on it that we don't see on the painting. Think about similarities and differences that you see in Pocahontas' face. The engraving is a very long, elongated image. Her cheeks are drawn in. Uh, she looks much older than the 21 years that she is. And when we look at the painting through oil paint, she definitely is a softer image. This color, which adds a huge factor in how you might read these two portraits or look at these portraits. If you think about the Pocahontas that maybe you've seen in a movie or a book you've read, and you look at this Pocahontas, is this what you would imagine you would see? Probably not the kind of clothing you would wear if you were just forming or helping to form a colony. Pocahontas actually was in England. She was there to promote the settlement of the colony. She very much looked like the people that she was going to meet. So that's why she has this clothing on, sort of not those images that we often think of with Pocahontas. Many. Excellent, thank you. Um, I, I have to admit, I love using these two portraits um, in the gallery space um, and specifically doing compare and contrast, um, which my supervisor, who is no longer the director of education, um, so wonderfully did in the video. Um, so I just thinking about um, the similarities and differences between these two. Um, and there's always a reason, right, in why we spend time um, looking closely and comparing and contrasting two images. And in particular with this one, it is to consider which one of these is based from life, um, and then which one of these is based on the one that's based from life, so a copy. So when you look at the engraving on the left, um, it's found in this wonderful little book called the Basilia Loja, which translates to a book of kings. Um, and it is considered to be the only known life likeness of Pocahontas that was ever created. Um, and so the book of kings was sort of a who's who um, in England at that time um, that Pocus, Pocahontas went over there um, and was, introduced at court, um, so on and so forth. Um, and so within this book, there are portraits of Pocahontas, Sir Walter Raleigh, Anne Boleyn, King James I. And then the painting came after. Um, and it came after because it was actually commissioned for Pocahontas's European descendants. So you have two portraits that are very similar, but also very different, um, being created for two very different purposes. Um, and so when we look back on these, we have to ask ourselves many questions about the why and the how of them. But in relation to our topic today, um, I wanted to ask one final question about who tells your story. So when you are studying history, 
why is it so important to discuss who tells your story and also for what purpose? So I'd love to hear from all of you um, quickly in the chat box. So why is it important when studying history to discuss who tells your story and for what purpose? A big question. <laughs> it is a big question, I know. Which I think will lead, lead us very nicely um, into our debrief. We've got a, a lot of great ideas coming through about perspective and point of view um, and how that changes how you interpret history. The idea that everyone is selling a particular story and um, they everyone's bringing bias. Yeah. Right. Um, so you have to think about people's motivations. Who are they leaving out? Um, great. History is shaped by values. I love that idea. We can, and we can begin to think about the engraving really as a piece of propaganda, right? Um, because it was for the masses and engraving just as it is now at that time would have been um, created and then printed over and over and over again. So it really was for the dissemination of many people, whereas a painting is always for one. And in this case, those European descendants. Those are really great observations. Thank you, everyone. Um, so to close us out, we wanted to um, revisit our um, essential question and our purpose for being here today. So as we've seen, um, women have varying levels of control over their story within these images that we've been talking about. How might, given that context, how might you use um, use these objects within your teaching? Are there any that um, spark your interest right away? Give you guys a minute to respond in the chat box. Um, any ideas about how you're thinking that these artworks, either individually or as a whole, um, might be useful to you in your classroom, um, especially as it pertains to exploring identity? Mm -hmm. Mm. Great. Deborah says, I might use them to guide students to tell their own story, um, which is a great idea, thinking about how students can express their own identity, mm -hmm. um, either through artwork or through writing, perhaps. Um, great. Ooh. I'm in a fast and furious now. <laughs> I've seen, I, so just so far, I've seen people mentioning Henrietta Lacks and Maria's Great Expedition uh, and Pocahontas. So it seems like, you know, the sort of combination of works that we selected are um, everyone sort of finding something mm -hmm. in there for them, which is fantastic. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I've got a great comment here about um, the age of the selfie mm -hmm. and how we choose to portray ourselves. Um, which is an interesting idea because in a lot of ways, you know, kids today do have a lot of a lot more control over their image than maybe right. kids in the past did, but mm -hmm. um, that has positive and negatives, right? Right. Um, I, I always like this idea, right, of um, how when we think about images of ourselves or images that we're creating of other people, how portraits very much can reveal and conceal. Yeah. Um, you know, you can choose to show aspects of your personality while keep other pieces of your identity hidden. Um, and I think that we've, we've, seen, we've seen that with these images today. Um, well, it looks like we've got lots of great ideas forming here. I think Ken's comment, you just can't measure learning like this on a standardized test. I think we would all be in agreement there. Yes. Um, but thank you for sharing all of that in the chat box. It's great to see the connections that you're making with our collection. We love hearing um, you know, how you're already thinking about how these ideas can be of use to you. So um, we are going to wrap up just in the, in the next two minutes. We have just a couple of housekeeping things, and then we'll stick around if there are any other questions that you have um, that we have not yet answered. So just uh, a couple of reminders. As I've mentioned a couple of times, that Learning Lab collection, Phoebe is now going to, um, in the chat box, she's going to paste 
um, the URL. So this will take you to um, all of the, the artworks, the videos, the resources, things we haven't even seen in the webinar, but are related to our topic. So all of that is there in the learning collection for you to use. And then for those of you who have not received your posters, um, if you are new to this webinar, uh, this, the webinar series through this, this November webinar, we will get those posters in the mail to you shortly and you should be receiving them by December 1st. So if you haven't received your poster set by December 1st, please let us know. Um, we'll share our emails on the very last slide and we'll make sure that you get one. Uh, and we, have our final webinar in this series next month, um, exactly four weeks from today on Thursday, December 5th. And note that it will be starting an hour later than today's did. We're trying to accommodate different time zones, even mountain time. We, we have not <laughs> forgotten about you. Um, so the, the December webinar will be from 6 to 7 p.m. And that one will be on um, remaking the rules, exploring women who broke barriers. And you can see sort of the two featured artworks from the poster set that will be the center uh, of that of that um, program. Mm -hmm. um, and just a quick plug, I, I know I see several Summer Institute alums in the audience today, um, but if you haven't participated in a Summer Institute at either SAM or MPG, um, we've got uh, links to our web pages below, and this is a great way to further your exploration of how artwork can serve you um, across the curriculum and your teaching. And I'm excited to share that um, Sam just uh, released our application for 2020 yesterday. So if you go to our website, um, you can actually now see the dates for 2020 and apply or tell your colleagues to apply. Um, so Awesome. And NPGs will probably be up within the next month. Thanks. So we're getting there. Are they the same, are they the same weeks? Oh, I don't know. Uh, probably. Okay. Well, but there's there's more than one, right? <laughs> so you can yeah, apply to both. You can right, apply you can, to you both. Come, yes. yes. <laughs> come one week to NPGs and one week to SAM. Right. Spend your summer in DC. Right, exactly. <laughs> and so then our, our very last slide for today. Um, it's just, this is us again with um, our contact information. So feel free to email us with, with questions um, it, or stick around uh, now if you have uh, something you'd like to ask. Otherwise, we wanna thank you all for spending an hour with us um, at the end of your day. We know how valuable all of your hours and minutes are. And so we appreciate you. Um, being here with us and we look forward to um, hopefully seeing many of you again next month. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. Thank um, you. We did have a question here about how you can access the webinar recording from last month. Um, so it is available on our YouTube channel um, and as it's also posted on the registration page on Sam's website. Yes, if you go to Sam's website and then go to the education section and um, go to uh, professional development, there will be a link on that page for the this webinar series and you can find the archive webinar right, right there on that page. Mm -hmm. um, with a question about, is it possible for elementary teachers to attend the summer institutes? Um, Brianna, what's your so our um, our policy for the portrait gallery institutes is that we um, welcome all classroom teachers, um, elementary and all the way up, honestly, through college. So yes, elementary school teachers mm -hmm. are absolutely welcome on the NPG side of things. And for Sam, um, our institutes are currently targeted towards middle and high school. Um, we have accepted upper elementary teachers in the past. Um, and we are considering expanding to elementary school. So stay tuned, there may be an update for you um, in coming months. Um, another question, could college students who are studying to be teachers attend? Um, for Sam's Institute, I would definitely be open to pre-service teachers. I agree. Um, I think that's a great uh, perspective to bring. So yes. absolutely. All right, well, uh, thanks again. We'll stick around for another minute or so if there are any other questions coming in. Oh, I'm loving that comment from Danielle that she used state names. I know, that's exciting. Um, since the last webinar, that's fantastic. 
That is great. And an inquiry-based lesson on perspectives on colonialism with English learners. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that, Danielle. All right. Okay. Great. Okay, well, Looks if there are no more there. questions, we will sign off. Um, Again, please email us if you think of a question later, and we hope to see many of you on December 5th. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.